Yeah, the next keynote is by Patrick Griffiths and we'll be speaking on the ESA Green Transition Information Factories. Patrick is an EO data engineer at the European Space Agency. Hey, good morning, everyone. Um, good to be back at Open Earth Monitor. Uh, last time was a year ago, and I'm joining you on the last day. And uh, that was already a couple of great talks here by Lindsay and by Gilberto this morning. So I'm switching the topic a little bit, uh, looking towards the um, Green Deal, and specifically the Green Transition Information Factories initiative that we're running at ESA. So I work at the science department, um, and this work is done with a number of colleagues. And let me start by setting the scene a little bit uh, in terms of context to this. So as you all are well aware, you know, ESA EOP does much more than building satellites and managing the missions. So there's a lot of data applications and new innovative uses of the data. And um, these applications are often driven by the requirements coming from um, international policies, uh, such as the SDGs or the Paris Agreement. Um, and recently, and uh, more increasing, the European Green Deal is at the center of attention here. And uh, you know, you're well aware that this is a very far reaching policy reaching into agriculture, energy, pollution, air quality, mobility. So it's very broad. And I think we're all sure that uh, Earth observation can make, make a contribution here. The question is just how, what is the exact contribution? How can Earth observation contribute to this uh, common objective of uh, you know, carbon neutrality for economy and society? So that's uh, kind of the context. And here, ESA has initiated this uh, Space for Green Future Accelerator concept. So this is a co-governed, independent, non-profit uh, partnership of green transition actors. So um, government entities, businesses, um, NGOs, um, and so forth. And it's about bringing together new funds in a, um, in a, uh, a non-for-profit um, uh, organization that we can then use to scale these solutions for the green transition to really make impact. So that's the larger thing that was started a year ago, and this is now taking up pace. And the concept of action for the Space for Green Future Accelerator is that there are these pathfinder activities. This is basically the research and development work we're doing. And then there are the seed activities, which um, are meant to develop and demonstrate new applications and new solutions for the green transition and uh, general sustainability impact. And then, and that's what we need this accelerator for, to really scale this beyond um, ESA programmatics and you know, typical ESA budgets. So that's kind of the concept for the Space for Green Future Accelerator. And one of these um, seed solutions that we're, we've developed here is the Green Transition Information Factory. So what is this about? Um, the Green Transition Information Factory is on the one hand about um, you know, showcasing and demonstrating the value that Earth observation together with other interdisciplinary technologies can bring to address the information needs in the green transition, right? So it's really about this supporting decision makers and various people to, uh, to make better decisions in the context of the green transition. It's also about enabling various users, including citizens, industry professionals to, to engage in the public debate and the discourse on the, on the uh, green transition. So it's really about empowering people to, to get involved and uh, come up with better decisions. And then it's about developing innovative and dedicated capabilities for the green transition. And this includes, in this case, new value-added, dedicated value-added products, indicators, interactive tools, and then also at the end to transform these into reproducible services, which is a common objective of many of us here. And I'll show some more details on that later. So um, with the initial uh, development of the demonstrator that I'm showing today, we cover these five uh, domains. Of course, the uh, green transition is very broad. You could add more. But these are the ones that we think are priority where we can really make an impact. And um, so this is energy transition, mobility transition, sustainable cities, carbon accounting, and a larger EU adaptation services uh, domain. So as I said, you know, we, um, we've developed this demonstrator um, for the country of Austria, um, pretty much um, beginning, uh, beginning of last year in spring 2022. And uh, this is really just a demonstrator, a pathfinder to show what we can do. And now, you know, we're going, uh, taking this to the next level. Um, but it was a strongly user-driven approach. So there was a, a, an intense phase of consultation with Austrian stakeholders and uh, other entities 
to kind of understand what are the priorities for the country in terms of the green transition, what are the required information needs, um, and what can we, uh, with our expertise, with our partners' expertise and our technology, what can we contribute to address these information needs? And then we developed uh, these dedicated capabilities and integrated these with interactive front-end tools to develop this uh, decision support system for the green transition. So this next slide here just shows an overview of the, uh, uh, the involved um, entities here, the stakeholders on top. And certainly, you know, they, ha they have this uh, super ministry in Austria, the Ministry for Climate Action and uh, Energy and Environment and Technology. So they are really our key user. And they've been very, very supportive and driving this, you know, with really concrete requirements on what they need to support their policy process and so forth. So it's, it, this was a very nice experience because, you know, the things you're developing are actually really used by, by a government to, to address the implementation of their green, green transition objectives. Then there's a whole bunch of companies that was involved and, you know, many other companies will contribute in the future. Um, we took this also uh, to the users in Austria and to the stakeholders. So after the release of the beta version of the GTIF in uh, March 2023, we had a, a consultation workshop at the ministry in Vienna. And this was also a really good experience. So 40 um, uh, organizations invited 125 attendees and you know, intense discussions and workshops and um, about 50 new resulting requirements on how to further enhance the initial set of capabilities that we have implemented. Um, in terms of the powering uh, cloud infrastructures, so uh, the current GTIF demonstrator is um, based on the services that the Eurodata Cube provides. So this is uh, Sentinel Hub, um, uh, GeoDB, Xcube, um, and EOX Hub. And we are now also looking more and more towards OpenEO to make uh, these capabilities available as replicable services. So the great thing here is, of course, that uh, Eurodata Cube already reaches into a whole number of uh, different uh, cloud infrastructures where we not only have access, easy configurable access to the Eurodata archives, um, but also to all sorts of interdisciplinary data, you know, not only the Copernicus data, but, you know, climatological reanalysis data, uh, uh, geomorphology data and 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 um, you know air quality data. So it's it's really um, excellent. And with these cloud services that we have now, you know, you can so easily reconfigure them to access a new collection here or there through federated uh, uh, access concepts. It's it's really fantastic. So let me show you a few example of the of the green transition um, information factory demonstrator for Austria. And keep in mind, this is a demonstrator. It's of course publicly accessible for over a year. So um, we invite you to, to go and take a look. And uh, there's also a feedback form. So um, uh, we, we're happy to hear your feedback. So let me start with a few tools that we implemented for the renewable energy, uh, uh, tr for the energy transition and the renewable energy. So the first one here is the um, tools that support site suitability assessment for wind and solar energy. Um, and here, you know, the country of Austria has quite uh, uh, high objectives. They want to be completely dependent on renewable energy by 2030, and they have a long way to go. Currently, they have something like 1,300 wind turbines. So there's a lot of public debate, like in other European countries also, you know, what should be the priority areas for expanding renewables and um, what type of conflicts need to be considered um, when we plan these new uh, energy infrastructures. And that's exactly what we do here. So on the one hand, we provide interactive tooling to um, assess the suitability of different areas for producing renewable energy. And then once you have determined these areas, then you can bring in a whole uh, a range of different variables to kind of look at conflicts with other uses, right? I mean, you know, what is the, the conflict between carbon, uh, you know, low carbon forests that experience degradation versus, you know, high value biodiversity meadows or so, you know, these kind of things we want to, uh, we want to um, help the user to discover in, in this uh, environment. So I'm going to play this animation here. It's going to start by showing the wind power density, which is a modeling output, um, uh, characterizing the suitability of a given area to produce um, uh, wind energy. And we calculated this for different turbine heights at 200 meters, 100 meters, 50 meters. And now the user has a whole range of constraining variables that they can bring in here, terrain, energy infrastructure, grid infrastructure, to kind of constrain the suitability grid. And then you end up with these areas that are more or less suitable. And then you can go now and look, okay, these areas are suitable. They are far enough away from settlements. They are you know, at a suitable um, elevation range. 
And you know, what are the current uses there? What is the um, suitability of uh, the soils there? You know, what is the productivity of the land? And uh, you know, all of these data sets, as I said, are integrated through simple uh, configuration changes. And um, this is a really big advantage, especially for, you know, for most of us in the room, this is like standard web GIS operations and also not so breathtaking, but you have to keep in mind that these people in the ministries yeah, they don't look at maps, you know. So, so when they when they discover that you can actually like overlay and intersect different products, they're like, wow, you know. So, um, this is really very helpful for them, and it's it's presented in a very intuitive way, you know, so that um, that they can really explore this without having to set any uh, up any GIS environment or so. We did the same thing, of course, for uh, solar energy, where we calculated the global solar radiance, four different seasonal time windows, and um, and uh, yeah, so next, GTIF should also, the whole idea of the information factory is also to empower users to kind of um, get the data and bring them into their own information systems. And, uh, you know, the initial kind of uh, functionalities that we implemented for this are, for example, to export the best zones that you get out of your site suitability assessment into a GIS, um, or to um, export also to summarize the analysis that you've performed in a type of infographic that you can then use in your uh, communication exercises and your, and your own policy work. Um, you know, this is the demonstrator, this is the first set of capabilities, but this is really the idea that we kind of empower users to gain information, gain insights and use them in, in other contexts then. So the next example here is the uh, detection of wind turbines. This is a, a classical machine learning based convolutional neural network approach using this late seasonal Sentinel-2 imagery with low sun angles where the wind turbines cast a long shadow and the uh, CNNs pick this up quite nicely. So this works well. I'm not sure what the contrast is like there, but you see it here in the auto photos there, the casted shadow. So, you know, this works quite well. And, uh, you know, we still have a 20% commission error, so we're still working on improving this. But what I would like to highlight is, you know, I always thought that uh, Western European countries, they know where the windmills are, right? There's no need for this. But actually, it turns out that our complex uh, government administration, the different offices have no idea about new wind turbines. You know, it takes years until the information trickles down to the respective offices. So this was surprising that stakeholders in Austria and other countries said, you know, this is really important for us. We need this capability to routinely map uh, increases in energy infrastructure so that we understand the dynamics, we know what's going on. So we've finished the one, the first iteration for the wind turbines. For the PV farms, we're still um, struggling a little bit. The model is not perfect, but we're going to now use kind of, you know, temporal aggregations of the swear bands in Sentinel-2. I think it's going to get better. And we are now transforming this into a replicable on-demand service so that we can run it for any country um, anywhere in the world using um, open your platform. Um, of course, there's an aspect of transferability. I didn't talk about that. That's another topic. Okay, this is another example here for the hydro energy um, for the reservoir monitoring. So, you know, it's quite interesting to look at the interplay of uh, solar energy production, wind energy production, and the temporary storage capacity of hydro reservoirs. And um, this is what we implemented here, basically using, where possible, Sentinel through altimetry data to measure the lake levels. But, you know, this is not a carpet mapping uh, mission. It has a kind of sparse uh, observation grid. So, um, you know, actually the intersection with um, uh, water reservoirs in Austria is only for like 10, 10 reservoirs or so. For the rest of the reservoirs, we um, implemented a uh, surface water mapping that we then convert into energy equivalents using um, Sentinel-1 and Sentinel-2, which works really well. And uh, any new acquisition is basically processed and we get this nice time series of lake level changes in these reservoirs. Um, next examples here are for the sustainable cities domain. There's a number of tools here. The first one you're, you're gonna see here is the uh, green roof impact score. So this looks at um, urban heat island trends in cities and then uh, provides a um, index, you know, for the value and impact of converting a conventional roof into a green roof in terms of impact on cooling in these cities. So. So this is a, this is a very nice uh, feature. And then the other thing that we did here is of course also the detection of individual PV panels on rooftops um, using uh, high resolution auto photos. And, um, um, and we also calculated the suitability of a given rooftop 
for energy production, uh, considering different um, solar conditions, and also considering the actual uh, roof geometry and the shading conditions in the city. So I know that Google recently rolled out the solar API, right? So we're looking at that, but um, you know, um, I think uh, we're, we're going in the right, right direction with this. Just a couple of ideas from the uh, mobility transition domain. So this is the um, correlation and, uh, explorer for, um, for um, human mobility data. So, uh, uh, you know, data based on the movement of smartphone apps and their location. So we can extract the human presence in different areas. And then we aggregated these mobility data to the same grid as the Sentinel-5P uh, atmospheric parameters. And then we basically provide a tool that allows you to explore the correlations across different main transport axes and uh, different um, uh, um, uh, air quality situations. And you know, this is not perfect yet, um, but it's pointing in the right direction. And to our knowledge, it's, it's the first kind of tool that brings these two variables together in an intuitive way for people to explore. And we're not, we're not at the end here, right? So this is continuing. Um, just a few examples here from the EO adaptation services. So we're, you know, GTIF is open for integrating and showcasing developments from other contexts. So um, at the beginning here, you and the animation will run through again. Um, you actually saw something that was here developed by your colleagues at URAC and uh, other colleagues. So the Alpine Drought Observatory, which is an excellent uh, science product and very nicely presented and also very nicely made accessible on the cloud. So we integrated some elements of the um, ADO, the Alpine Drought Observatory. Then we have some uh, dynamic products here on the snow water equivalents that we want to link to the hydro reservoir and the storage production and the uh, energy forecasts of these hydro plants. Um, we also integrated the land surface temperature uh, heat explorer, comes from Geoville. Um, so this is based on eco stress aggregations. And, um, you know, I think there's a very nice kind of learning effect here when people who are not so familiar with this type of geospatial data, when they do the overlay with land cover, you know, and they suddenly see, wow, all of the hot areas coincide with the open agricultural soils and the urban areas. So again, you know, this is, you know, nothing new for us, but um, for people in, in policy or in, uh, you know, in non-science disciplines, it's, it's quite interesting to, to better understand this. So um, I invite you all to go and explore this a little bit and provide feedback and let us know if you have anything that you would like to have integrated here. I think it's getting quite a bit of publicity and um, attention and we're happy to integrate. Um, you know, we don't want to reinvent everything. So if you have good components that you think could be integrated here, let us know. So um, I told you that we're moving beyond the Austrian demonstrator. You know, there's a lot of work with Austrians. Now we need to step back a little bit. And we have just uh, launched this GTIF Kickstarter's uh, invitation to tender. So this is the next phase of the GTIF activity. And we will place three new contracts that will each uh, develop um, uh, you know, a set of new innovative capabilities um, for initially within the first six months for a new national showcase. But then for the remainder of the two year period, they will work on uh, the robustness and scalability of these methods and then demonstrate them in three multinational showcases where we look at the, the, uh, these indicators and information uh, insights uh, basically across national borders, which will be very interesting. Um, and then there is also um, you know, the defined goal here at the end of this activity to transform all of the suitable capabilities into replicable on-demand services. And I mean, we hear that often, and I, I just wanted to show you on the next slide what we currently understand with that. So, to have a you know fair data compliant on demand service currently what we're thinking and you know this we have a set of interoperability requirements that we put forward to our activities um, and what we currently understand with this is first of all to refactor re-implement the algorithm or the workflow following uh, one of our interoperability community best practices and currently this is uh, the open eo api open eo process graphs and open eo user defined processes which have very nice properties in, a, in terms of abstracting things like data access, in terms of providing the analytical building blocks that can be executed in different cloud backends that support the API. So that's a very, um, you know, that is certainly a very convincing uh, uh, community best practice for the implementation. And um, of course, stack is important. You know, I think you're all aware. And the third one that we are exploring is the OGC application packages, which is basically a CWL, um, a common workflow language connected to a Docker container. 
Um, so that's the one part to refactor the algorithm and workflow as one of these community best practices. Then we need to expose the, uh, the workflow, this mature workflow in, um, in different interfaces. So we can use the, in this case, the open your platform marketplace or the uh, open, uh, you know, European open science cloud marketplace. So you need to expose it somewhere so users can find it, of course. And then the third element is to onboard this service into the ESA network of resources. So this is our uh, sponsoring mechanism to support the development of European um, EO cloud services. And um, once you have onboarded your on-demand service into the network of resources, users will be able to request sponsoring for the use of this service from ESA. ESA will pay for it. The service provider will get real world feedback on the usability and the utility of their services, and you will be able to use this service for free, even though there might be a commercial business model behind it. Then there's another upcoming ITT that uh, we wanted to bring to your attention. So um, this is the application propagation environment, and I discussed it with several of you. So here really the goal is to, to really foster the uptake and reuse of uh, R&D application results, especially algorithms and workflows and ensure their long-term availability to the EO community. And um, this we will do by streamlining and facilitating the hosting of uh, R&D algorithms, as we have just shown on the previous slide, um, following dedicated interoperability requirements. Then there will also be a part that will really look at the, um, not only the availability and response of these services, but actually also their technical and scientific uh, functioning. Are they actually producing what they're uh, uh, promising to? Then there's some dedicated services in this um, RPEX application propagation environment on um, technical algorithm enhancement. So a lot of the scientific source code that's developed by uh, academic labs is not really fit for production workflows. So we're seeing this quite a bit. So before we move this into CDSE or a large cloud environment, we will go through some stages of uh, technical source code optimization. And we've done a few tests now with uh, Times Up, for example. And it's quite amazing what you can get out of this. So we can uh, bring in efficiency gains of 70 to 80% by porting this and refactoring it on, on GPU. And uh, the academic labs are quite happy that we're actually doing this because they don't have the, the capacity to really do this, okay? Um, yes, this is a, so we have a, a, you know, a larger budget for this and secured this for five years. It's closing around uh, mid-November. And um, you know, if you're interested, there's the, there's the QR code here. So that's, that's all I had. Thank you. Thank you very much, Patrick. Anyone has a question? Questions, comments? Patrick, uh, very impressive the work that uh, ESA is doing that you are working with. I have a curiosity. You mentioned that you are actually measuring uh, potential of uh, solar rooftops. Uh, is, has there been any concern raised regarding privacy? Because you're basically saying, well, you could improve your energy by so much if you put an energy, let's say, uh, or uh, solar panel in your rooftop. Yeah, so you're exposing someone, you know, if someone has a high suitability, why are you not doing it? So is that, is that your point? Yeah, that's yeah, the yeah. point. I mean, is yeah. there, I mean, I look at it in a very positive way, mm. but I just yeah. imagining that given the invites, that might be someone who is... Yeah. Yeah, Pretty or sensitive. maybe the ministry, you know, they put up huge solar panels, but they have very low suitability for energy production. So we're exposing yeah. them, right? Right. You know, I don't want to worry about those aspects, you know, let's let's focus on the things that EO can contribute to these uh, to these needs. And, you know, uh, the complicated European GDPR and privacy laws, uh, let's leave it to others, you know, I'm not going to worry too much about this at this point, but it's an interesting consideration. Landra? Uh, no, thank you for the uh, presentation. It's really impressive, the platform. So uh, there is a kind of any next uh, step or plan to scale up for other uh, countries or... Leandro, were you sleeping? I had it here. Um, <laughs> let me see. Maybe I skipped the slide today. No, but that's the GTF Kickstarter's ITT. So this is an invitation to tender. It's going to place three new contracts. 
um, to really look at the scalability and, and develop new capabilities that will be initially developed for national context, but then scaled across at least three different countries. And then all of these capabilities will be made available as replicable on-demand on services, forming kind of an ecosystem of reusable capabilities. That's the plan. And these three countries are selected? Or no, the, no. So the country can... Uh, you can propose, you can propose okay. the country. We have some uh, considerations for how we evaluate this, of course, you know, but, mm. um, but it's open to suggestions. Okay. Mm. More, more questions, feedback? I also want to congratulate you. I saw in Athens the first version in December. You made so much progress, your group. It's really, really yes, impressive. And, the, and I just want to say, I think you all agree with me. The Europe needs these facilities and the world needs something like this as soon as possible, no, really. No, no. You know, for bids in, in Vienna in November, we're going to have a completely new interface. So it's going to be even nicer and also slowly connecting to APIs okay. for interoperability and everything. So Okay, so you're coming to Thanks, bids Tom. in Vienna. Please uh, follow up on uh, Patrick's talk. Uh, Edzer, please. Yeah, um, Patrick. So in this project, Open Earth Monitor, um, we are struggling with, with basically with two things. One is that there are a lot of use cases that produce very large data sets. Global coverage is the, the thing that Open uh, Open Geo Hub does, uh, and many other partners. And the other is that we that we develop uh, services that create things on demand, right? So now we, I, what I learned the last few days is that this Copernicus data space ecosystem should be the place to 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 host these things, right? To put these things because it's thought of as an ecosystem. Yeah, I think eventually that should be our focus, you know, because we're gonna have the whole um, Sentinel collections that are spinning disk archives, no longer a long-term archive, you know, and that's the new, you know, merging of the DSs, at least in exactly. Europe, uh, that's what we need so, to focus on. So the critical word is you say, eventually. Yes, but the, yes, our, yes. Our question is we would like to do that now. Right. Could let's, you help us? Or yeah, yeah, let's, ask let's, Kevin let's do it. it. Edza, and you're aware that, you know, OpenEO interface is provided also on CDSE, which is a great achievement, I think, also for the OpenEO community, you know, so we, we already have the interface there. And actually, with our colleagues at JRC, we just discussed yesterday that we want to do some community-driven benchmarking of CDSE if it is actually supporting the needs of the community in terms of bulk processing operations. Because in ClearDS, we had a lot of issues and a lot of teams start working on ClearDS, but then they move into AWS because they say, oh, it's just not working. It's too expensive, you know. So we want to put some numbers on that to kind of make some recommendations on what needs to be improved in order to make it fit for purpose for European users. Should so, we wait for that? or shall No, we start you, should, you should be involved in that. We so, should do it, um, right. but, uh, but we can already now try to fast track your, your requirements, you know. So let me know. Yeah. Good. Thanks. Uh, Julia, please, last question. Thanks, Patrick, for this great presentation. Uh, so for me, it's still not very clear the, this demonstrator for Austria. Mm -hmm. um, I understand there's these Kickstarter projects now, but what is actually the long-term goal or maintenance? Like you said, like you worked a lot with the ministries and they, they were blown away about the capabilities. Um, but what will be, do you want them to use it? Will they then subscribe for it to use it? Or yeah. will finance it yes 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 so the, the idea is to have it less uh, you know dashboard centric um, approach as we have right now so really we want to kickstart the development of these uh, GTIF instances in different countries to uh, to get them started but in the case of Austria we want to hand this over to them they should take ownership they should take over the operations of this and maybe we provide some technical some consultancy um, support to them but um, that's really the idea. We try to set these things up. We try to provide reproduce, reusable components, but we don't want to, to manage this. We don't want to define who has access to this. This should be in the, you know, in the hands of a key stakeholder like the BMK ministry in, uh, in, in Austria. So um, yes, so the long-term vision is really you know, not think of dashboards, but think of an ecosystem of capabilities that can be used to build a dashboard to the national requirements to fulfill the information needs they have. So in the end, it will be done on the ministry level who maintain the system. Yes, yes. Do yes. you think there is the technical capabilities? No, they need house? to work with a, with, an, uh, with a national IT provider to do that. But, um, you know, we cannot be doing this for... Also, a lot of ESA member states are now saying, hey, we want a GTIF, you know, but we're not going to build this for everyone. We're going to provide components and then they can put this together according to their needs. That's kind of the idea, vision. 
Okay, thanks. Uh, Nakem, she has something. Thank you, Patrick, so Thank much. Uh, please applause to Patrick for his talk.